we had ended and we've been speaking for the past two classes that the ultimate objective and purpose of life is that one should achieve perfection within himself. And when you achieve that perfection, now you're able to benefit from the ultimate level of good, which if you did not achieve that goodness, you were not worthy or you weren't, weren't qualified to be able to be exposed to God's presence. As I cited the Talmud, to bask in the radiance of God, which is the ultimate level of being exposed to the absolute perfect being, which is God himself. There's no beginning, there's no end. So the soul says to the intellect, I understand what you're saying. So now I understand what the objective is. Chief perfection. That's the foundation. Now, what do we build on that foundation? And as a result of that, the basic question, which is a very significant, important question, if God is perfect on the absolute level and God has no needs, why did God choose to create a creation? What do he need it for? We do many things. It brings a level of satisfaction to ourselves. We have needs. Need automatically indicates that you're lacking. So need means you're satisfying something that you don't have. But if God is infinite, that means nothing is lacking in God. There's no beginning, there's no end. And he's the totality of everything on an absolute level. You can't even use the word God needed to create existence or he had to create existence. God has no needs. He has no reason. So if he has no reason, what is the reason why he did create existence? If God is the creator and he is the creator, why did he do it? So even before we go to the Ramchal, the very the famous statement of David and Tilim, King David says in Tilim, Olam Chesed Yibone. God created existence due to Chesed, pure kindness. When you when we even when we do kindness to a person. You see a person who's needy. We never saw the person before. But somehow, when you do kindness to that person, because you touched in a certain way, because you touched and you feel bad for the person because of the need that he has, so you want to satisfy that need. You want to fill in that void. But when you fill in that void, what do you do? You alleviate the pain that you feel for him, or you satisfy yourself, because now you have a degree of satisfaction, which you did not have before. So whatever, even when we speak of chesed, indiscriminate kindness, when we do something, it's with an objective which either advances us or brings us to a point where we're deficient and we don't feel that deficiency as we're in pain. You feel another person is suffering your pain. So by addressing that suffering and satisfying the need, you're no longer in pain. So it's a need. You have a need. Well, that's, it makes you feel good that you did a good deed. So that's adding something that you didn't have before. With God, there's no adding. There's no detraction. So why did God create existence? We have said we should be complete. That's the ultimate, to meet all challenges which allow us to achieve perfection within ourselves. But now let's ask the more fundamental, but why did he create existence? If he is who he is, he had no reason to create existence because he has no needs. So the intellect responds and says, the answer is simple. However, to understand the answer, it's based on another question. What's the other question? Why did God want to create existence? What was the impetus? So the intellect is asking the soul, what do you think? Like very often a person asks me because they say, what do you say? What do you think? So the soul says to the intellect, 
I can't answer. I want you to answer. You explain it. Or we can respond. You know, we all, we have a certain limitation and capacity. We can't go beyond that. For instance, we speak about God being infinite. Could we fathom what infinite is? We can't fathom what infinite is. If we're finite, how we can't. But we understand infinite means there's no beginning, there's no end. And we have many questions because of that. If God is infinite, where's the place to anything but for God? But we're an expression of his will. But if he's, there's no beginning, there's no end. Where does it leave room for us? There are many questions. We can only understand things within a certain context. But beyond that context, because we're not infinite, we can't grasp what that is. So the question is, why did God create existence? So the intellect will respond that I'm only going to be able to explain it up to a point, but there's certain aspects of the answer that unless you're the infinite, you don't understand why. And he will explain what he means. He says, God in his essence is good on the absolute level. I've mentioned this in the past. God is good on the absolute level. Now, a person is good. Let's say a human being is good. Something good does goodness. When we, a person is a good person, why does he do goodness? He seeks out others to do good with him. He has, but with us, it's the need. Because the human being is deficient. So by doing good, it gives us satisfaction. With God, there's no satisfaction. Why? Because God, if he's perfect, satisfaction means you're adding something to God's being. But the principle is, God is good on the absolute level. Good does goodness. Good provides good. Not that it's a need. It's just a reality. So now, what's the ultimate good that God could provide? Because he's the essence of goodness on the absolute level. What is the ultimate level of good that he could provide? Creating a human being who is worthy to partake of God's goodness. Because God, good does good. And what's the ultimate level of goodness? To be a beneficiary of what's good on the absolute level. I'll give you an example. Just the semblance of it. You know, the various levels of charity. The ultimate level of charity is known as Matan Besaser. When you give the money to charity, you don't know who the recipient is, and the recipient doesn't know who his beneficiary is. So you have, you know, you know who the beneficiary is. So as a result of that, what, what is that? You know exactly what your money is doing. You know the value of, of your kindness. You're feeding a person, educating a person, protecting a person, whatever that money provides, whatever that service provides. The ultimate level is not to know anything. The recipient, the beneficiary, doesn't know who's, who's his benefactor, and the back benefactor doesn't know who the recipient is. Why? So on a simple level, you would say, because if you know, you would want certain recognition for that goodness that you're doing. And if you meet that person and he doesn't acknowledge, there could be a little bit of a problem. What's the problem? He knows, he may not know that I'm doing this kindness with him, but let's say he 
reacts or speaks disrespectfully to his benefactor, not knowing he's his benefactor. How does it touch the benefactor, being a human being? Although he doesn't know, he can't fault him. But is, is that the quality of that person that I'm supporting, that I'm helping? So you say it's best not to know. Not to know. I know I'm going a good deed. I give it to a person who's responsible, has made evaluation that the recipient is worthy of that, receiving that stipend or whatever that may be. Good enough. But I'm saying it's even more than that. As God doing good, creating man, so man should be the beneficiary of his goodness. But God has no need. But good does good. So to emulate God in his goodness, how should we emulate God? We do good for the sake of good. It's in a context we don't even know who the recipient and who the beneficiary of that is. It's like you give money to a person who you rely on. He says, I will distribute it as I feel fit, but it'll be in your interest. So the one who gave the money doesn't know, is it a human being? Is it for the environment? Is it other areas? He has no idea. The less you know, the less you're actually be going to be a beneficiary of doing that kindness. So why did you do good? I did good because I'm a good person. I want to do good. So the closer you get to doing good because you do good, the closer you're emulating and reflecting God's act of doing goodness. Because since he is the source of goodness on the absolute level, Something that's good does goodness for that reason. There's a positive commandment of you must emulate the ways of God. And the Talmud says, as God is merciful, you should be merciful. As God is gracious, you should be gracious. As God clothes the naked, as he clothed Adam and Eve, when they realized they were naked, you should clothe the naked. As God buries the dead, as God buried Moshe Rabbeinu, you should bury the dead. We should try in every aspect of our lives to emulate the way God interacts with this existence. I had once said, we know there's no words in the Torah that are superfluous. Every word is accounted for. And yet we find in the portion of Noah, the Torah uses an extra nine letters where the Torah could have expressed itself in a more abbreviated way, and it uses a word, which the way it's expressed, to add nine more letters. And the Talmud acknowledges this immediately. Why? For instance, how does one say a non-kosher species in Hebrew? Behema temeo. A contaminated species is, means a non-kosher species. But the Torah, when God instructs Noah to take two of the non-kosher species into the ark and seven of the kosher species, he refers to the non-kosher species as behema asher enena tohura, the animal that's not pure. But saying enena tohura requires a number more letters. If God would have said asher enena, if he would have said temeo, it would have been less letters. But when he speaks to Noah, Hashem says, God says, Asher Eneda Torah. So the, what do we, what's the takeaway? So the Talmud tells us in Psochim that from here we learn, that when a person speaks, you should speak in a more refined manner. That's how you should speak. More refined rather than less refined. Why? Because saying tomato contaminated, it has a very negative connotation. Something is contaminated. When you say something is not pure, it's more positive. It's saying it in a more positive light. For instance, I always mention the Chazanish, who studied Torah and invested every fiber of his being in understanding the Torah. When he would hear something which was incorrect or false, in Hebrew, the word false is sheker. It's falsehood. He would not say false. He would not say sheker. He says, enenu emes. He would say, it's not true. Because sheker 
is something very negative. So rather than it's expressing it in negative, he would say it is not true. That's the way the Chazonish would speak. And that goes into that a person speaks, you should speak in a more refined manner rather than in a manner which is more earthy or more negative. That's the takeaway. So the Torah goes and use, writes an extra nine letters to teach us this lesson that a person speaks, you should speak in a more refined manner. So I ex- ask the question. You mean because God wants us to be more refined people? Is that why? So I said, no. This goes into Mahu Afato. God wants us to emulate him. As God, when he speaks, he speaks in a Loshnikia, in a more refined manner. You should speak in a more refined manner. Not because you be, should be a more refined person. As not though being before a more refined person. As the Torah says, Valachta Bidrachov, you should walk in his ways as he's merciful, as he's gracious, as he clothes the naked, as he buries the dead. All this is emulating his ways. As he speaks, Veloshin Akio, as he speaks in a more refined manner, you speak in a more refined manner. It goes, this is included within Valachta Bidrachov. So we asked why. Why does God want us to emulate his ways? God wants them, of course, there's a mitzvah of motid book. God wants you to cleave to him. In any relationship, what is the basis for relationship? Commonality. To have combat- compatibility, you must have com- com- commonality. So the more we emulate Hashem's waves, we create a greater commonality. If we have greater commonality, there's a greater compatibility. Therefore, there's a greater level of cleaving to God. That's boutique book. So God gives us all these ways, levels of behavior to conduct ourselves, to assume his profile, because if we assume his profile, there is a, a, a commonality, and that allows for a greater degree of co- compatibility of a boutique book. A boutique book. God himself, the Ramchal asked, if God is perfect on the absolute level, why did he create what was the purpose of creation? So he says the principle is one, God is good on the absolute level. And something that's good on the absolute level does good, does good. So creating man is creating a setting, an opportunity for man to be a beneficiary of that goodness of God. And the reason why man is given choice, as the Ramchal will explain later, why wasn't it just gifted to us? Because just as God's goodness is unrelated to anything but himself, our worthiness should not be from an external source. Rather, it's self-earned. It's due to our own initiative. And that's the reason why the human being was given free choice that we're fully deserving because we've chosen to do the right thing, which is only due to our own initiative. And the reason why a person, God forbid, is culpable is because he chose to do the wrong thing, but it was only due to his own initiative. So therefore, to create that commonality, which is closest to Hashem, where everything is dependent on us, it's not external, so we should be a greater beneficiary of that goodness, because the commonality is greater, so therefore, we're able to be dovig to cleave to him. So I'm saying, when it comes to Tzedakah, the greatest level of Tzedakah is Matan Beseser that the one who's giving the money, he doesn't even know who the recipient is. The recipient doesn't know who the benefactor is. Why? Because if you know at any level, there's some kind of gain. You gain. I know what my money is doing. It gives you satisfaction. Let's say you have no idea what, what your money is doing. You give it to a person you rely on, and he distributes it. And he doesn't even share with you where he gives it, but you rely on it. Do you have any gain other than just knowing you're doing a mitzvah? You're doing kindness. You know your money is being used for goodness. When you do it at that level, you're closest to Hashem. Just as Hashem does goodness, not because he has a need to do goodness, but rather good does goodness, when you give matan b'seser, you're doing goodness to do goodness, not because you're a recipient, a beneficiary of the goodness that you do. 
Shlomo tells us in Mishlei, Zodi Matonis Yichir. A person who despises gifts, he will live. He will live. Why? Sony Matonis Yichir. A person who rejects, turns down gifts, he will live. Why? So the Malbim in his commentary initially explains that God himself always gives, never takes. God is a benefactor. Hashem gives, never takes. So by giving and never taking, what are you doing? Emulating Hashem. Again, this goes into the Lachta Mitzrocha. As Hashem is a no-say, is a giver, he's a benefactor, and he's not a beneficiary, identically, if you give and you don't take, you're assuming, again, that profile, Hashem as being a benefactor, he's not a beneficiary. So again, that again, that contributes to the commonality, and as a result of contributing to the commonality, therefore, there's a greater level of compatibility. So we, when we speak about both Tibok, you cleave, you cleave at that more advanced level. Because at the most advanced level in every aspect of your life as a human being, you assumed his characteristics, which allow for this compatibility to take place. And therefore, you could be Botit Book. 